I'm going to take you on a journey through a real math problem I had that through the process of solving it revealed deep, mysterious, and beautiful relationships that I really want to share with you. But we'll need just a little bit of background about conic sections first. One interesting fact about conic sections that you may or may not have heard is that five points uniquely describe a conic. A little asterisk here because there's some degeneracies, like if two points were exactly on top of each other or they're all in a line or something, but that doesn't really happen in practice. It's strange, but you can see how all conic sections are really just ellipses and hyperbolas. A circle is just a special case of an ellipse, and a parabola is just what you get when you're exactly halfway between a hyperbola and ellipse with a center at infinity. So that's five points. But did you know that five tangent lines also uniquely define a conic? Just to clarify, tangent means the conic touches the line once and it's parallel where it touches. But what if I told you that not only does this work with five points or five tangents, but you can describe conics with any combination of points and tangents, as long as there's five total. In fact, these start getting a lot more interesting. For example, what conic goes through these four points and is tangent to this line? Well, this one does, but there's actually two solutions now. Likewise, it's the same situation with one point and four tangents. And if you thought two solutions look complicated, the next two examples have four solutions. So if you want a surprisingly fun challenge, see if you can draw on paper any arrangement of three points and two tangents, or vice versa, to have four ellipse solutions. Spoilers coming up, so give it a try. All right, so where are those four solutions? Well, here they are. Pretty crazy looking, right? And of course, the last configuration also has four solutions. And personally, I like how this one animates the most. So I've shown you these cool animations, but how did I actually find these conic solutions? Well, there's some well-known ways to do it for five points, but let's take that as a given for now, since I want to show you something really cool. It turns out that there's a duality between points and lines. That is, every line has a dual point, and every point has a dual line. To see what's happening, I'll first draw a unit circle at the origin. If a point has a distance to the origin r, then the dual line has a distance 1 over r in a perpendicular direction to the line to the origin. So as I move the point farther away, the dual line gets closer to the origin and at infinity passes through the origin. Conversely, points near the origin have dual lines far away, and a point on the origin is the line at infinity. The amazing thing is, we can transform the problem of five tangent lines to one of five dual points, solve for the conic, and then find the dual conic to solve the original problem. So if we have any algorithm to solve one of these problems, 
we automatically can solve the dual problem. But what's the dual of a conic? You may have seen a conic section represented like this before, but it's actually much cleaner to write it like this. Here the vector x is a homogeneous coordinate, and the matrix A is a symmetric matrix. If you expand this out, you get the same equation. This form makes finding the dual super easy. Turns out you just invert the matrix, which is super convenient. And duality isn't special to conic sections. A lot of theorems about points have dual theorems about lines, and theorems about lines have dual theorems about points. So it's a really useful geometry tool. So before I get to that hard math problem, allow me to go on one more tangent. Get it? Tangent? Let's talk about drawing conics. I mean, after all, how do I draw these pretty visuals? Well, for an ellipse, it's actually pretty easy. You have two vectors, a and b, plus the center c, then the points on the ellipse are just a sine theta plus b cosine theta plus c. And sweeping through a full rotation of theta gives you all the points on the ellipse. If you want to draw a hyperbola, you can actually use the same formula. Just replace sine with sine hyperbolic and cosine with cosine hyperbolic. So if you ever wondered why it was called hyperbolic sine and cosine, now you know. But back to the ellipse. We haven't made any assumption about a and b being perpendicular. So what happens if they're just any skew vectors? It's still an ellipse, which means there's not a unique way to represent an ellipse in this vector notation. And that's interesting, but here's the part that really surprised me. Most ellipse formulas are identical, even when the axes are skew. For example, the formula for the area of an ellipse is just the magnitude of the cross product times pi, and that holds true even in the skew case. If we were also to make a right triangle in the ellipse with a squared plus b squared equals c squared, that c squared quantity also stays the same, regardless of skew. There's also this formula to determine if a point is inside or outside an ellipse, also works. And this one, for lines tangent to the ellipse. Again, it still works. And there's even more examples than this. It really blew my mind because it's such an interesting fact, but I've never seen it published anywhere. And with that out of the way, I think we're finally ready. So here's how the problem was stated. I'm given a quadrilateral, and I need to find an ellipse tangent to all the sides and that has a specific size. The word size was intentionally vague, so it gives the problem some flexibility that we'll come back to later. The algorithm also has to be really fast, so I can't just brute force a solution. Here's how I tackle the problem. Ignoring the size constraint for now, and just focusing on the four tangent constraints, we know there's an infinite number of solutions, so I wanted to quantify what some of those solutions look like. One technique to always try first is, are there any trivial solutions? And the answer is yes. This line is a solution. If you think about it, a line segment is just an infinitely thin ellipse. You can see how the ellipse stays tangent to the line in the limit. And of course, there's another trivial solution right here. In fact, there's one more trivial solution. Can you find it? You'll have to think outside the box, literally. By extending the lines, we can find two more intersections. So a thin ellipse here would also be tangent to all four lines. And here's where I notice something odd. The midpoints of these lines, which are the centers of the ellipses, seem to all lie on the same line. And it doesn't matter how I arrange the quadrilateral, it's always true. Isn't that weird? But it gets even weirder. I started thinking, the centers of these ellipses happen to lie on a line, maybe that's not a coincidence. And it's not. The center of every solution lies on this line. That's just crazy! And there's a beautiful mathematical proof that gives deep insight into this problem. Probably. I was never able to prove it. I mean, I'm not three blue, one brown or something, I'm more of an applied math guy, so just knowing it worked was enough for me and I moved on. But if any of you are mathematicians, I'd love to see a proof about why this is. And it really simplifies the problem, because now there's only one free parameter, which is where on the line the center should be. So I've got a three-step plan to solve this problem. First, find the center line, which I've already shown how to do. Next, given a size, find where on the line the center of the ellipse should be. 
And finally, given that center, use the quadrilateral to find the axes of the ellipse, and then I'll have the complete solution. Let's start with that last one first. Suppose we've already chosen that center point on the line, and we just need to find the axes. We'll have to go back to that tangent constraint formula I mentioned earlier. We have four tangent lines, so it looks like there's four equations with four unknowns, the x and y components of a and b. However, remember that the choice of a and b are not unique, so there's really only three degrees of freedom there. On the flip side, we've already used all four equations to get the center line for c, so one of these is going to be redundant anyway. Overall, that doesn't seem like a problem because we still have three equations and three unknowns, but this is also a very nonlinear system of equations and would be incredibly difficult to solve term for term. Instead, I'm going to do some matrix manipulation to help simplify this. So maybe it still looks complicated, but I've actually reduced this nonlinear equation into a linear equation of this new nonlinear variable x. That means these equations can solve for x just using a regular 3 by 3 matrix inverse. Cool, so we can get x now, and we just need to extract the axes from it. Taking the adjugate of each side reveals this. The solution matrix times itself transposed equals x. So it seems like we need some sort of square root of a matrix. And of course, there is actually a way to square root a matrix using my favorite technique, singular value decomposition. In SVD form, square rooting a matrix is really easy. Just square root the numbers on the diagonal. So finally, that gives us an A and B axis for the ellipse. It works, but you can see it's skew. That's not a huge problem, but it's actually really easy to make them perpendicular. If you think about what an SVD actually is, it's a pure rotation, followed by an axis aligned stretching, followed by another rotation. But that first rotation isn't necessary at all, because it won't change the shape of the final ellipse. So by just dropping it entirely, that guarantees perpendicular axes. Plus, by changing basically nothing about the entire process, it naturally extends to hyperbolas. Though they're not relevant to the original problem, it's just nice to see that they still work. Only one piece left. I can find any tangent solutions now, but where can I put the center to find an ellipse with a specific size? Remember that size is vague. It could be the length of the major or minor axes, the area of the ellipse, something else. What's important is that it's fast to solve. And that's when I made another bizarre discovery. Remember that c squared length I mentioned a while back that was an unusual invariant? Well, it turns out that that c squared length is also exactly quadratic to the position on the line. Again, I have no idea how to prove it, I just observe that it works. And finding that quadratic here is also really easy. Remember, there's three trivial solutions on the line which have three known c squared values. So using those three data points, I can easily solve for quadratic coefficients. And this was the simplest solution, and the one I ended up using to solve the problem. 
Since it's quadratic, there's usually two solutions that have the same size. But a lot of times, one of them is actually hyperbola, and sometimes both. And since it's quadratic, it also means in a sense there's kind of a unique minimum size solution, which is interesting. However, the c squared length isn't the only way to do it. For example, squared area is, for some strange reason, exactly cubic with line position. This time, the three trivial solutions are the zeros to the cubic, since they all have zero area, and negative areas are hyperbolas. It also means we can easily find the unique ellipse of maximum area inside the quadrilateral using the trivial solutions. Using the square length of the major or minor axes also turns out to be quartic with the line, but it made that part of the problem too difficult to solve, so it didn't really seem like it would be useful. As you can imagine, I've certainly glossed over a few details here and there just to focus on the interesting stuff, but this entire visualization, the source code, equations, and a download you can play with are all on my GitHub, so do check that out if you're interested. If you've made it this far, I hope your mind has been blown as much as mine was. This is slightly different from what I normally do, so please let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more hardcore math videos like this in the future, and thanks for watching.